Good morning. So I am George Callas from uh, Sorbonne University, uh, the new name of the university in the center of Paris. And uh, first of all, I want to transmit the best wishes of the French Minsoc and um, its members to uh, their uh, American uh, mineralogist colleagues and cousins uh, for this centenary celebration. Of course, we, we are all involved in the same uh, wish to make mineralogy a, a success. So the, the first uh, session of uh, this celebration will concern sustainable development and the use <coughs> of mineral resources, sorry. And uh, the talks will be given by Gordon Brown uh, from Stanford uh, University and Mike Coachella from Virginia Tech and PNNL, Northwest uh, North uh, Laboratories, uh, concerning the impacts uh, and uh, of the mining uh, activity and also on the future uh, of our resources, so exactly in the topic of this first uh, theme. And uh, after their talks, uh, I will encourage some questions about these talks, and we will, I am sure, enlarge the discussion to uh, major topics uh, related to the future of our societies. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real honor for me to give this talk. Uh, I've been an, a member of MSA since uh, I was about 12 years old, I think. Uh, <laughs> I actually was a charter member of the Mississippi Mineralogical Society as a kid. I used to collect minerals. What few there were in Mississippi, there weren't very many. But <laughs> anyway, so uh, thank you very much, George, for the introduction and uh, for moderating this session. And also thanks to uh, Carnegie and all the other sponsors you saw, and Steve and, and um, Peter in particular for organizing this. This is a great uh, showing for the MSA. So um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the mining sites that I've worked on over the years and, and some of the impacts that are long-term, the legacy of, of these uh, mines. But I thought I'd start with uh, a look at uh, some of the things that have actually shaped our society. This is a list of uh, some of the important events, uh, such as Agricola, um, known as the father of mineralogy, uh, Howe from, from Paris, uh, the father of crystallography, and on and on, the discovery of x-rays, uh, the founding of MSA, and then my favorite topic, of course, is synchrotron radiation, so I could not list that in red. It's at the bottom there. Uh, and I also wanted to point out that um, in 2018, there were officially 5,413 mineral species. Uh, there should actually, actually be one less. Uh, uh, we found that the chrysocolla is not really a mineral. It's a, it's a mixture of spartinite and amorphous silica, so it should be five, uh, four, 412 rather than 413. Anyway, um, so... These are just staggering events that uh, really shaped uh, not only our society, but also the science of, of the world, um, especially the discovery of X-ray diffraction. So uh, science uh, sort of takes leaps and bounds ahead over time, but, but it actually occurs when we have new experimental methods and new instrumentation, new theories and so forth. And we have some of those, of course, that have helped us, uh, including X-ray diffraction and X-ray fluorescence. Uh, we also have mass spectrometry. We have modern digital computers that allow us to do density functional calculations at a much more fundamental level. So a lot of this has really uh, pushed forward the science that we do. And we also have to acknowledge uh, transmission electron microscopy, a major tool. In fact, our Roebling medalist this year, Peter Busick, is winning the Roebling medal at the uh, MSA meeting or the GSA meeting in Phoenix. Uh, so please come to his talk. I'm sure it'll be wonderful. But he was one of the pioneers of the applications of TEM to uh, mineralogy. Uh, so all of these tools, I think, uh, have a very important use for various uh, areas, but in particular, uh, looking at the environmental impacts, especially the long-term impacts of uh, mining and ore beneficiation is a wonderful example of how uh, the modern methods that we have all taken for granted can be used to do very important things for society. So one of the advances that's been made, in fact, we could also plot it here, the growth in population, as you'll see later, but this is an example of uh, synchrotron radiation uh, and how much it's changed the landscape of uh, research in, in general. Uh, so we're now up to the fourth generation synchrotron radiation sources with the Linux coherent light source at, at Stanford and Slack, and that produces basically x-rays that are orders and orders of magnitude more bright or intense than what, what we used to use for x-ray tubes. So when I finished my PhD work at, at Virginia Tech years ago, we were down at X-ray tubes there. So look at how much things have changed over the years. So let's start with the California Gold Rush. That was uh, 1848 when uh, J. 
James Marshall discovered gold flakes um, in a, uh, a small river or stream. Um, that brought lots and lots of people to the West Coast. Uh, San Francisco grew from a population of 200 in um, 1846 to about uh, 36,000 in 1852, a huge increase in population. Uh, this was one of the reasons that California became the 31st state. It was very quickly designated a state. And the influx of gold seekers uh, really changed the landscape, particularly um, in, in impacting the Native Americans that were in there. Many of them were killed by the miners that were coming in. And one thing that um, I didn't think about until Brad Mills, one of my former students, uh, pointed this out last weekend at, at the Stanford graduation ceremony, that the gold rush in South Africa took place at about the same time as the gold rush in California, but with very, very different societal consequences. And one of the differences was that the, the money stayed in, in, in California from the California gold rush, but the money from the South African gold rush all went to London. So a huge difference in, in how this uh, impacted the societies. Okay, this is an old 49er doing his thing with, with a gold pan. If you've never done that, you should do it before you die. It's, it's hard work, uh, but it can pay off if you uh, are, are persistent. Uh, hydraulic mining was a, a major thing that happened when uh, they ran out of the large gold flakes or gold nuggets. And this was coupled with the use of mercury, as we'll see in a minute, uh, to extract the fine green gold from these uh, plaster deposits. Lots and lots of gold was derived from the uh, California gold rush, but it, won't, it was only about 5% of the total of, of gold uh, taken from the earth so far. Mercury played a huge role in, in this. Um, it's uh, had a rich history itself, uh, culminating with our uh, worries about uh, monomethyl mercury that, that occurs in uh, large predator fish like the tuna. Uh, lots and lots of interesting properties. It's the only metal, common metal that's liquid at room temperature. We'll get uh, in, into that a little bit later, but uh, it bioaccumulates in the food chain. And uh, I love tuna, canned tuna in particular. It's one of my favorite meals. And it's full of tuna, full, full of uh, mercury, as, as, as you probably all know. So you should actually uh, restrict your in, intake of uh, tuna if you, if you can. Um, here's a map of California showing in gold, the uh, various gold mines in red, the various mercury mines. Uh, they're intimately related to each other because uh, a lot of the gold, as we'll see, was sorry, a lot of the mercury, as we'll see, was uh, used for the extraction of the fine grain gold from these uh, areas that are in gold. Uh, basically, the liquid mercury is put into these sluices and it amalgamated with uh, the gold, the fine gold flakes. At the end of the day, the miners would clean out the sluices and have a retort where they would heat the mixture, drive off the mercury vapor, try to capture as much as they could. And that left behind the gold and uh, was used to, then to make uh, nuggets and so forth, the bars. There are lots of mercury minerals. This is a, a partial listing of them. It's a really amazing thing because mercury is such a minor element in the Earth's crust. But uh, here are all the major minerals that have mercury as a ma major component. Um, here's what mercury ore looks like from New Idria, a place that I've spent a lot of my years over the uh, last uh, 30 years. On the left there, the strawberry ore that was uh, famous for that area. Um, I had the uh, pleasure of visiting uh, the original Idria deposit a couple of years ago in the, what was Yugoslavia, now Slovenia. And uh, there, we, my wife and I went underground, and one of the things that just sort of hits you right in the face is, if you look up there, uh, I guess there's a pointer here, here it is, um, at the top. Oops. Well, I'm missing this thing, the bottom one. Okay, here we go. If you look at the top, uh, this, this slide up here, or this picture up here, you'll see that in the shales uh, underground, you see liquid mercury oozing out of the shales. So it's just all over the place, and this is one of the major things that they recovered. Okay, so in the case of California uh, gold rush, uh, gold mining, uh, there, were, there was lots of mercury taken up to the gold country. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it was lost. In fact, if you look at the red at the bottom there, total amount of mercury lost to the environment from all of these operations in the gold country resulted in about between 3 million and 8 million pounds of, of mercury lost to the environment, which is a, a huge amount. Uh, unfortunately, uh, all of the rivers that are draining from the area of the, of the gold mining uh, come right down to, to San Francisco Bay. And the question is, how does the gold, how's the gold transported? Not the gold, but the mercury transported from, from the gold country. That, that was lost during the, the gold mining and beneficiation. Well, it comes down, it turns out, as nanoparticles. And so Chris Kim, one of my former students, who's now a professor at Chapman University in Southern California, spent lots and lots of time on the electron microscope up at the 
National Center for Electron Microscopy at Berkeley National Laboratory. And what we finally found were these things called um, mercury sulfide nanoparticles. Here they are, these little black dots that you see there. It took about uh, four or five tries before we started seeing these things. Once we saw them, we knew what they looked like, and we found lots and lots of them. So it turns out that most of the transport of mercury, uh, even from the gold country, where we introduced liquid mercury, is now in the form of mercury sulfide nanoparticles, cinnabar nanoparticles. And so uh, that's what we found, and we uh, have identified that using various techniques, and that seems ba basically to be the major form that's transported from these uh, gold country um, settings. Okay, the mine itself, New Idria, was one of the mines. There, in fact, there are 2,000 mines in California, all of which are now abandoned. This is the second largest, the New Idria mine, uh, in San Benito County, and uh, this is a picture taken back in 1910 versus a picture I took in 2010. Uh, and so uh, this is a, 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 that's a little mine, a acid mine drainage pond that you see there. This is an old dump. This thing operated for a, lar a large number of years and produced lots and lots of mercury. Uh, this is the uh, close-up of that acid mine drainage pond. The pH is about 2.5. You'll notice the white efflorescence, which is magnesium sulfate salts. Uh, you'll also notice sort of a cloudy thing on the water surface. That's a mi microbial biofilm. Uh, you look close, you'll see the orange color of the sediment. That's mostly ferry hydrate and a, a few other minerals. Um, and it, it turns out that uh, there's lots of this mercuric sulfide nanoparticulate matter in that uh, sediment. Uh, one of my other students, uh, Adam Jew, who's still at Stanford as a research associate, uh, did a thesis on the uh, biogeochemistry of this particular setting and found out that the presence of, uh, of these bacteria that are present in, in this biofilm, as well as other places, changes the solubility of cinnabar, which is about 10 to the minus 53 normally, by at least 30 orders of magnitude, becomes much, much more soluble. It also turns out that uh, cinnabar, uh, in, in the form of nanoparticulates, can be easily converted to uh, monomethyl mercury, which is something that's uh, relatively new. So this is uh, one of the consequences of mercury mining in California and other, other sites in the world as well. This is what the old mining uh, the furnaces looked like. Uh, the heat, they were heated up, the, the material, the, the raw ore itself, was heated up to 700 degrees C. Uh, the vapors were driven off. Um, the so-called calcine was just dumped into the stream beds. So this is one of the legacies of the mining of mercury in California and other parts of the world as well, this red stuff. Unfortunately, the roasting process was extremely inefficient, and we ended up with lots and lots of um, material that still has uh, liquid mercury as well as other forms of mercury in, in them. Um, this shows the original coils that uh, were used to condense the mercury vapor into liquid, and that was packaged and sent up to the Sierra Nevada, for example. There were stack losses um, from the four rotary furnaces at New Idria. Uh, Schutte in 1931 did a study, and it was basically found that about 85 pounds of mercury per day per furnace was uh, generated and lost to the uh, surrounding atmosphere and, and, and uh, soils. So about 340 pounds per day, this thing ran a long, long time. So the loss of this uh, stack material, particularly the particulate mercury, uh, resulted in about half being uh, deposited locally, the other half going into the atmosphere, uh, polluting basically the entire globe. <coughs> Surface uh, concentrations are shown here. This is, again, in the soils around the, the furnaces and so forth. Um, ultimately, we need to know something about the molecular level structure of the mercury in order to uh, figure out if we need to remediate or not. And uh, the technique of choice we found for doing this is called X-ray absorption spectroscopy, which is a synchrotron-based technique. We ran lots of model compounds as shown here. These are XF spectra for different com compounds. The ones that are in purple are the ones we, ha we had to contend with at the New Edria site. Um, some of these have much higher solubilities than others, um, and those are the ones we really have to worry about. Here's some of the excess spectra of the ores from the different mining sites that we've looked at over the years. Um, you, you'll see that we can actually get reasonably good excess spectra even at low concentrations using synchrotron light. It turns out, uh, f fortunately, that cinnabar and metacinnabar are basically out of phase in terms of ex the excess signal. So we can easily fit uh, uh, model compounds to this and figure out how much cinnabar versus metacinnabar is present in these uh, sites. We looked at lots of different sites. The things that are in red are the ones that we have to worry about because they have very low solubilities. Uh, or I, I should, should say very high solubilities. They dissolve very easily. So if we find those in our waste material, we must do something about that. Notice that there's no 
liquid mercury shown here. And in fact, we couldn't really look at that um, using uh, XS spectroscopy initially because um, if you look at this slide here on the upper left over there, you'll see in blue uh, that's what the spectrum of liquid mercury looks like. It, it's really just crap. You can't do anything with it. It's just noise. But it turns out I had an idea, and that was that the melting point of liquid mercury is minus 38 degrees centigrade. So if you go below that, you actually crystallize the mercury into alpha mercury, and you get beautiful spectra shown in, in red there. Again, out of phase with the other uh, things that you see. So we could easily detect that for the first time, and this is one of the major uh, discoveries we made and shows that you have a, a lot of uh, a very good correlation between elemental mercury that's present and the flux that goes out into the atmosphere just from sunlight. Okay, so let's now look ahead for the next 100 years. What can we expect will change over that period of time? Well, for one thing, uh, we will have a lot, of, a lot more societal concern about uh, ecosystem damage caused by mining, and there are lots of good examples of that. I'll run through California real fast. In California, here are some of the arsenic that is associated with gold mining, shown in, in, in red in the various places. So we have lots of arsenic as a result of that. One of my students, Andrea Foster, who's now with the USGS, as part of her thesis, looked at arsenic in these mine wastes uh, in the gold country and found that arsenic sorbs very strongly onto iron oxyhydroxides, as shown on the left panels there. Um, we also did work with George's group in, in uh, Carnoulis, uh, France, in Provence, and we looked at a very uh, arsenic-rich waste material here, 300 parts per million in the wa waters, for example, pH3 waters. Turns out that this is a pretty, pretty complex situation because of bacteria. So biogeochemistry is a really important thing to worry about uh, when we are dealing with things like uh, mercury or arsenic that results from coal mining, as you see here. Uh, we get various arsenic uh, minerals, uh, it changes by season depending on which bacteria are present. We also, um, not we, but uh, Guillaume Morin's group uh, was able to identify a mineral called, called tuliite, which is a major arsenic mineral, uh, again, that sequesters arsenic in these settings. One must um, be careful, though, when you do XFs, uh, it doesn't actually capture everything, and this shows us a good example of that. This is looking at arsenic absorption onto uh, magnetite nanoparticles. Up in the left, up, upper left, you see a transmission electron microscope image of uh, one of these samples uh, with the arsenic absorbed on it. We discovered using TEM that a lot of the uh, arsenic goes into amorphous phases that are present on the surface of these minerals, and this basically results in a huge sorption capacity for magnetite for arsenic. Now, moving on to other sites such as the uh, large gold mine in uh, Minas Gerais, which I had a chance to visit a couple of years ago, a place called Paraca 2, again, a huge gold mine, huge amounts of arsenic coming off as a byproduct of the arsenopyrite that's there. And it turns out to be a major risk. It's caused uh, lots of damage, uh, 200 times the concentration uh, that's permitted is present in the soils of the town of Paraca 2. We only stayed there a couple of days, I, I should tell you, because of that uh, concentration. This is a huge, huge uh, open pit mine that continues producing lots and lots of gold. So Virginia Simonelli, one of my good friends from uh, the um, university near there, um, was, has done lots and lots of work on this, looking at the uh, fate of the arsenic that's produced from the gold mining, including density functional calculations to uh, basically uh, look at the fundamental chemistry that goes on with arsenic absorption. Uh, another thing she did was looking at how the arsenic is basically transmitted to humans. About 80% comes from food. I, I really didn't know this. Um, uh, much less from the water and soils and so forth, but most of the arsenic contamination into humans is, is via food. And this sh that shows that there as well. So just uh, probably the same in the U.S. as well. So one of the issues or consequences is it, it, probably in the future we will not have large mines like this, open pit mines, but instead uh, probably some going back to underground mining and much less of this will, will occur. Another societal concern is about human health impacts of minerals. Mickey has already mentioned chrysotile. This is our local chrysotile deposit in New Idria, which is very close to the mercury mine that I just showed you. Short fiber asbestos, uh, that white hat there, right, by the way, is sitting on Gary Ernst's head, although I should have taken a lower picture, but I didn't. This shows chrysotile, uh, the fibers uh, that have been so controversial over the years, starting back in the early 1970s when Irving Selikoff first uh, warned people that chrysotile asbestos might uh, be a health hazard. Turns out that uh, we, that's still a controversial issue. Uh, here's some of the 
mechanisms we use to get rid of it, the mucociliary uh, escalator that you see there. Um, this is actually a macrophage trying to en engulf a, a asbestos fiber in human lung tissue. So this is still a major issue. I, I still do consulting as does Mickey for various places. It turns out that uh, right now Johnson & Johnson is bleeding millions and millions of dollars to lawsuits over ovarian cancer that is claimed to have been caused by the exposure to chrysotile. Again, very much controversy about that. Okay, uh, we have also um, increased concern about uh, adequate mineral resources, for, uh, adequate energy, adequate food, adequate clean water to serve the needs of the rapidly growing population. Uh, this is the forecast for the future. It turns out we'll be up around 10 billion people by about 2050. Larry Miner, one of our PhD students from um, uh, Stanford and a former USGS employee actually quit over a, a problem with the leadership of the USGS. So did uh, Mary Hits Hitzman, by the way. And this is one of Larry's nice papers uh, talking about the future of mineral resources. In terms of future, we had a nice issue of elements um, that George Callis put together. We have, Mike and George and I have a paper in here as well, so I, I urge you to take a look at this if you're interested in this sort of thing. Turns out lots and lots of forecasts have been made about the, the future. Uh, Limits to Growth is a very well-known publication that actually tries to forecast the future. These are some of the figures from that showing this uh, growth and then the drop-off of mineral resources. We had a wonderful uh, debate at a symposium we had at Stanford back in December 2017. Vala Ragnar's daughter was one of our plenary speakers. She came and gave her view of the world, and it turns out that she thinks things are going to go away and we're going to have some real problems. Meinert and others thought just the opposite, so there was a lot of tension and lots of interesting discussion that followed from that. One of the issues that George has really brought to the front is uh, laterites, which contains some of the interesting um, ores that we need, some of the interesting elements. Cobalt is one in particular. In fact, if you didn't know it, uh, cobalt is present in the lithium-ion batteries that, that power now almost everything that we do remotely. And so um, sources of cobalt are, are really quite rare, and this shows some of the interesting cobalt concentrations in laterites in New Caledonia, for example. Also, George's group uh, used a synchrotron radiation to look at, at the first time at uh, scandium in these uh, laterites, and uh, this, again, is a very, very interesting strategic element with lots and lots of uh, modern uses. And George was able to show using, again, uh, Zane's uh, spectra, which are shown on the, on the right here, um, that uh, scandium is present on the surfaces of gertite particles, primarily, about 80% of it does that, and the other 20% uh, is in hematite particles. So knowing where the, where the scandium is in this case really helps in terms of, of extracting it from the earth in a safe manner. Uh, lots of things are changing in terms of new techniques. We have new ultra-fast, ultra-bright ultra sources of x-rays at, at SLAC, for example. Uh, there, this is called the Linux coherent light source. We have new projects that will actually increase the brightness of these things, so huge advances are being made in that area. And uh, this will, will happen over the next couple of years. Uh, ultimately, what I want to end up with is that the, there's going to be an increased demand for geoscientists, particularly mineralogists and geochemists, and environmental scientists working in concert with all these other people, including microbiologists and so forth, to really assess the environmental impacts of mining and the extraction of ores from Earth on the human population. And with that, uh, I'm going to just give you some real quick take-home messages. I'm not going to give you a reading of these things, but here they are. And at the bottom, there is an abundance of environmental energy and mineral resource issues that should keep mineralogists very busy for at least the next 100 years. Thank you very much.